This week on the Green Left News podcast, medical journal The Lancet estimates that the real death toll in Gaza is close to 186,000 and healthcare workers in Australia have taken action in response. The University of Melbourne is repressing student activists and we just talk with Katrina Harley about the Disrupt Barrow Hub campaign and why the Woodside Project is so terrible for the environment and First Nations people. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Green Left News podcast. I'm Isaac Nellis and I'm talking to you from Gadigal country in Sydney. I'm Riley Breen and I'm joining you from Wadjuk Nungal land in Bulu, Perth. And we acknowledge that uh, sovereignty was never ceded and always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Green Left pledges to stand in solidarity with First Nations people uh, on this continent and all around the world and um, in campaigns for justice, sovereignty and rights. Now, I've got some really good uh, topics this week, uh, so stick around because we're talking to uh, Petrina Harley, who's from the Disrupt Borough Hub campaign and has just done a really, uh, really staunch, really inspiring protest uh, lock-on action, um, so she's going to be talking about that. And we also speak to Reham from uh, the Uni Melb for Palestine group about the repression that uh, the University of Melbourne is is uh putting on two students and some staff at the university who were involved in the Palestine Solidarity Encampment. But before we get to that, we are starting with the fact that the 40th consecutive week of protests against Israel's genocide in, Ga in Gaza and our Labor government's direct complicity in it took place in uh, cities this week and uh, the past weekend. Um, so that's 40 consecutive weeks in, in uh, Gadigal, Sydney and Nam, Melbourne. And in other cities and towns, it's been, you know, consecutive fortnightly or monthly or regular protests for, for the past 40 weeks. And I think it's, you know, it's very, it's unprecedented, never seen before to have protests every weekend like that, um, that have been happening, and which is very, you know, inspiring, incredible. But it also means that this genocide has been going on for nine months straight without any, any break or any rest for the people in Gaza. Um, and, uh, I, I guess what, one of the things that we've been kind of tracking over each week at each protest is this, is the death toll continually rising. Um, and the, the death toll figures have been published by the Gazan health ministry, um, and are now sitting at about 38,000 deaths, which is, uh, mostly women and children. Um, but there's been a study that's been published by medical journal, the Lancet, which has found that the number of people killed directly or indirectly by Israel is likely closer to 186,000. So this is partly because, you know, it's hard for the Gaza Health Ministry to actually keep track of the official count with, you know, the complete destruction of so much infrastructure in Gaza, um, the absolutely overwhelming uh, nature of the genocidal attack. Um, you know, it's hard to even, you know, count the bodies, let alone identify them, um, which is part of how they've been tracking, uh, tracking the death toll. And at the same time, with this massive destruction, where, where in February it was uh, estimated that 35% of buildings in Gaza had been destroyed, um, so it's probably even more than that by now, um, there's an estimated 10,000 people still under the rubble. So uh, pretty, pretty, pretty clear that the the actual kind of death toll and horror and destruction in Gaza is, you know, even worse than is currently known. And I think it's going to be a big, uh, you know, project. Once we have a ceasefire and once we have steps towards uh, justice and, and peace in, in Gaza and Palestine, um, there'll be a reckoning of looking back and figuring out what the actual damage that has been done. Um, uh, throughout this period has been. Yeah, so I guess um, what, what really jumps out with um, the Lancet report here is that, you know, you, you can count the official number of deaths, but it's, it really fails to capture just the, the scale of damage to to human beings that actually happened as a result 
I mean, so I mean, you, you know, it's not just the people who die direct as a direct impact from a bullet or you know a bomb, but it's actually the the long term effects of starvation, of organ damage, the inhalation of dust from rubble, the uh, women giving birth without anaesthetic. It's you know, and medical uh, treatments. So the amount of people who have complications from births, it's, you know, it's all those things, the, the inflammatory effects of acute stress that almost every single person in that region is going to be under. I mean, the, like the, all these things just actually compound the health effects in ways that you can't easily capture. I think um, the, that's what the Lancet's kind of drawing on in, and I think even the Lancet is going to be making a very conservative estimate to those numbers. So the, the real death toll, I think we're not probably not ever going to going to know for sure, but it's got to be so much more than what what we're actually counting. Yeah, and, it, and it's important to keep in mind there's only like two million people in Gaza, so that's like close to ten percent of the population, um, which you can only imagine. It's like two million, more than two million people in Australia dying. Um, I, I think how they've calculated it is looking at kind of recent uh, conflicts and, and other wars where the kind of indirect deaths that you were mentioning, so from, you know, lack of food and water, um, you know, diseases that spread when there's uh, all the healthcare infrastructure has been destroyed um, and you know, uh, all the other things that you mentioned just then, um, it's usually three to 15 times the number of direct deaths, which obviously from, you know, bombs and, and bullets and, and things like that. So they've they've put a conservative estimate of four uh, indirect deaths per one direct death, so which is on the lower end of the kind of recent uh, estimates to find to get to this one hundred eighty six thousand uh, uh, figure. So yeah, it's definitely um, you know it could be a lot worse is potentially. So we we won't know the true effects. You know, and I think it's it's part of Israel's actual plan is to destroy all the health infrastructure. And to um, at the same time uh, tr uh, kill journalists and stop people from getting a, a real sense of what's happening on the ground, so that there can't be this accurate reporting. Um, so some people, you know, look at the look at the fact that it's from the the, the, the Gazan Health Ministry um, death toll figure isn't like you know uh, fully kind of like confirmed by all these other independent sources, but that's been a, a, a purposeful decision by Israel to not let anyone else even get a chance to corroborate any of the data. So it will be something that will have to take place uh, uh, in the future. But um, I guess what's important as well uh, that we wanted to talk about this week is that the healthcare workers across, well, it's actually internationally, but particularly across this country, called a uh, National Day of Action on July 12th. Uh, which they called the Code Blue uh, National Day of Action. And the Code Blue is the kind of uh, hospital emergency code when someone's, you know, in a critical condition and needs uh, urgent help. So they're saying it's a Code Blue in Gaza. Um, so the action came just uh, just after those Lancet figures were uh, announced, but also as a response to the intentional killing of healthcare workers in Gaza and the bombing of hospitals and ambulances. So... The Australian Health Workers for Palestine group who, who organised this National Day of Action said, to date, there are no fully functioning hospitals remaining in Gaza. At least 541 healthcare workers have been killed and 259 have been unlawfully detained by the Israeli military. They said that Israel's attacks have deliberately targeted Gaza's health workers and health infrastructure to advance its genocide. So it's good, you know, healthcare workers have been speaking out and taking action um, for since the genocide began, um, but it's good to see this this coordinated national uh, day of action. Uh, the, the rally here in Gadigal country, Sydney, um, was held at the 24-7 picket outside Anthony Albanese's office in Marrickville, um, which just as a side note, as we're recording has been, um, you know, uh, one of the key organisers was arrested briefly and the police are trying to clear out the the picket. Um, but at the, at the time of recording, they, they're, they're holding out strong. They've moved back a few metres from, from the actual entrance to the uh, office, but now on the footpath, so it's continuing. But we'll, we'll, I think we'll talk a bit more about that next week. Um, but at the Sydney vigil, psychiatric doctor Muntasa Mahmoud said, 
Our inherent responsibility to care for other people doesn't end when we clock off on our shift. Being a healthcare worker is not just a job, it is a devotion to humanity. So the Sydney Vigil was attended by more than 50 people and also heard from a nurse who had recently returned from a Palestinian Australia New Zealand uh, Medical Association aid mission to Gaza. So she spoke about uh, the realities on the ground. Yeah, and uh, healthcare workers in uh, Melbourne held a protest outside the University of Melbourne and the Royal Melbourne Hospital, uh, where disability workers, nurses, doctors, and medical students, they all spoke in solidarity with healthcare, healthcare workers in Gaza who were risking their lives. Ola Aladasi, a medical scientist from Gaza, told the crowd of countless friends and family she has lost, I was just working with them a few months ago, and now I'm seeing their lifeless bodies in the media, which is just fucking heartbreaking. Um, most, of have, most have been killed in front of the patients, she said, explaining how many healthcare workers stayed with their patients after Israeli soldiers demanded they leave the hospitals. The, um, and the, the code blue action in Kwana Yurta, Adelaide, was held outside Foreign Affairs Minister Penny Wong's office. I, I saw at that uh, rally, obviously we're not in Adelaide, but they read out the names of all the 500 healthcare workers, 541 healthcare workers that were killed by Israel since October. If you look at the, if you calculate it, it's two healthcare workers killed every day. Um, so it's pretty horrifying, pretty, you know, yeah. makes it pretty clear that it's targeted. There was also a similar action here in Bullet Perth where the, the same uh, names are read out by uh, many healthcare workers there as well as uh, a few speeches from, um, uh, there was a speech from a, a Royal Perth doctor, and uh, I actually don't have the details of other speakers. Um, and there were also similar protests at Miller Darwin, and at Impartry Alice Springs, and uh, similar healthcare, similar vigils were held by healthcare workers around the world. Yeah, and you can definitely find a lot of the photos and details from the various vigils that were held across the country um, on the Healthcare Workers for Palestine Instagram page. Um, and I think there's also kind of state-based, like Healthcare Workers for Palestine, New South Wales, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you can check out uh, some of that detail. And if, if you're a healthcare worker and you want to get involved, definitely um, do so. I think it's, it's a... it's. It's great to see, you know, people from all these different uh, fields and different facets of life um, getting involved in solidarity with Palestine. And I think, you know, as, as that psychiatric, psychiatric doctor we uh, mentioned earlier said, it's like, as a healthcare worker, it's your actual, you know, responsibility is caring for people and, um, and looking after others. And that extends beyond just the workplace into, and it should, you know, be part of a kind of day-to-day -day life and extend also beyond borders to, to helping people who are trapped in one of the worst, um, you know, genocides we've seen uh, definitely yeah. in our lifetimes. I mean, uh, doctors so often, they, um, you know, I've, I've, I've experienced this myself, they only, they only see, you know, person at a time in a room and they treat problems very individually, but, um, you know, you can actually stop problems from happening in the first place. You can imagine just how much um, acute trauma and stress is happening in Gaza right now and how many people are going to have long-term psychiatric illness because of that. <laughs> and, yeah, that's on top of all the you know, horrific deaths and illnesses that are, are going to be happening and all of it is entirely preventable. <laughs> so, you know, you could consider it preventative medicine. Yeah, 100%. Moving on to our next uh, discussion point for this episode, another section of society that's taken a lot of action in support of Palestine is the students uh, and university staff as well. Um, and last episode, we spoke with academic and NTU member Markella Panagiris about the crackdown on activism at the University of Sydney um, following the almost two month long encampment uh, at that university. 
And this week, we'll be speaking with Reham from Unimelb for Palestine, uh, which is the group that organized the Palestine encampment at the University of Melbourne. Um, now, students at the University of Melbourne have been have facing disciplinary uh, threats of disciplinary action for participating in the encampment, in particular, 21 students who were involved in you know, organizing uh, the encampment and the sit-in at Mahmoud's Hall. Um, so we're excited to talk to Reham about that and about uh, what's come out now is that the students were being surveilled by the university as well. So we're uh, looking forward to hearing about that and how students are resisting. So I guess, um, first of all, for people who, I guess, haven't been following the story as as closely, um, and we've been reporting on the Unimelb uh, encampment as well as all the other ones around the country, um, could you give a, could you briefly talk about the the Solidarity Encampment at the uh, University of Melbourne and the sit-in at Mahmoud's Hall. And I guess, um, what are some of the wins that have been achieved so far? Yeah. So we started the Solidarity Encampment on the 25th of April. So that was set up on South Lawn um, and that was sort of in place for about three weeks. And in that three weeks, we saw like a huge amount of growth, of support. Um, community really got behind us in that time. We had teach-ins and food being brought by community like it was a really beautiful activist space um and i guess the goal of the encampment was to pressure the university to cut their ties with weapons manufacturers um particularly those that were involved in the genocide in gaza um so the encampment was happening for about three weeks and then we had a rally and an autonomous group of students decided to um start a sit-in in formerly Arts West, Mahmoud's Hall, um, renaming that building to Mahmoud's Hall and then, yeah, beginning a sit-in. So that went for about a week um, where people, you know, had their tents and marquees inside just in like the foyer and open spaces on the ground floor. Um, the message was still the same um, to cut ties with weapons manufacturers. Um, but in the time that we were sort of on the lawn, we didn't really receive, you know, much of a response or much engagement from the university um, in that respect. So this was just a way of drawing even more attention to the issue and, you know, letting the university know that we're serious about wanting these changes. Um, after the week of the sit-in, we... Um, so during the sit-in, negotiations were sort of ongoing with the university um, and they intensified. And then at the end of the week, we agreed to um, disclosure. So that meant that the university was going to disclose all of their ties to weapons manufacturers, particularly those research collaborations and partnerships. So that was agreed on in exchange for packing up the sit-in and leaving the building. So we did that and then the university um, began their disclosure. I think it was on the 30th of June. So they started to disclose um, in more detail their weapons ties to various weapons manufacturers and also to the Department of Defense, uh, US Department of Defense. Um, so yeah, that was a major win. It's definitely uh, step one of a few. So the ultimate goal is to get the university to divest from those companies. But I guess we have to know the extent of their involvement to then try and get them to divest. 100%. And I think, um, you know, it's important to celebrate the, the small wins along the way as well. Um, but I guess the university has responded uh, by cracking down on, on students um, and they've threatened, I think it's 21 students with expulsion or other, other disciplinary measures. Um, could you talk a bit about what these measures are and um, I guess how students are responding to this crackdown? Yeah, so the penalties range from a caution all the way through to um, suspension and termination and quite a few in the middle that sort of affect our enrolment. So yeah, it was 21 students. Um, we're quite surprised about how heavy handed the university has been, um, particularly since we were in ongoing negotiations, you know, in good faith with the university. We came to that agreement. It was a mutual agreement. So we're surprised that the university, I guess they're trying to it seems like they're using these misconduct notices to punish the students for um, getting the university to agree to the disclosure, which is quite a strange thing to do, in my opinion. Mm. Um, and yeah, there are only about 21 students that were issued the misconduct notices, but I at any one time in the building, there were probably between 70 to 100 people. So they've selected people, I think, to try and make an example, try to deter people from doing the same thing later on. Um, so yeah, I guess the students have been quite 
surprised and not surprised at the, t at the same time, I guess surprised in terms of the methods and the way that it's come about, but not surprised in that, you know, we knew that the university was not happy with us um, mm -hmm. being there. Um, and yeah, we had a rally on the first day of the hearings, which was last Wednesday, had a lot of community support um, in that. And um, yeah, I've just been trying to advocate for ourselves the best that we can with the university. Yeah, and, and something that's kind of come out is that the university has been uh, employing kind of surveillance strategies on students, um, particularly obviously the students who are being uh, threatened with the disciplinary measures. So could you talk a little bit about this surveillance and what kind of stuff they've been doing? Yeah, so when we all received the notices, we got a few documents attached to an email. One of those documents had CCTV footage, um, like stills of each of us, as well as Wi-Fi tracking location. So essentially they've taken like stills from CCTV and then also they have been able to identify exactly where particular students have been at what time, in which building, on, on what level. Um, and they've attached those sort of Wi-Fi pings to, you know, those documents. Um, so yeah, we were really surprised that they sort of took those measures to identify particular students. Um, there were security guards at the entrances of the building for a period of time that were taking people's identification. So the security guards already had identification of people that had willingly given their details, but the university mm -hmm. chose to, you know, use these like tracking and surveillance methods to find particular students. Um, and yeah, I guess it's pretty shocking as well because in 2016, the university, when they adopted their new um, Wi-Fi network, they said basically we're just using this Wi-Fi to identify dots on a page and just to identify like traffic throughout the university. But, yeah. you know, we're not breaching privacy because we can't identify the students. Um, but obviously the university has lied. So <laughs> you can see um, the location is directly attached to like a student ID that has been then used to identify students. So yeah, that's been pretty, pretty shocking. We didn't expect the university to go to those lengths, but um, mm. they have, and it's opened up a whole new conversation about, you know, the way universities are using student data. Um, people are really hesitant to, well, I know I'm really hesitant to um, connect to the university Wi-Fi, and, mm. you know, I'm just very cautious now when I'm on campus. Um, so yeah, it's been pretty surprising actually. Yeah. And I, I've, seen some comparisons drawn uh, obviously not to the same scale but like the surveillance of of palestinians in gaza and the west bank and now surveillance being employed on students at australian universities is, is pretty chilling yeah um, we have um, one of our one of the students who's receiving misconduct she's actually from palestine and she you know had a really hard time like grappling with that because you know she'd left palestine come here to study she'd left a you know highly surveilled um occupation state and now she's come here and sh the same sort of technologies are being used on her when she's protesting to try and you know um get the university to divest from those companies that are being you know that are um, involved in the killing of her own people um so that was quite difficult for her to to get her head around and also you know we don't know what the t what technology is being used like which companies are being used um it would be pretty ironic if those companies were the same companies we're trying to get them to divest from, but we don't know exactly <laughs> <laughs> which yeah. which text being used. Yeah, I wouldn't, wouldn't be surprised. Um, <laughs> I guess this is kind of all taking place in a bit of a broader context of, I guess, anti-protest laws. There's a few other universities that are also cracking down on activism. Um, um, last week on the podcast, we were talking about the, the campus access policy at UCID, which is basically... Um, making people have to ask permission to even like hold a megaphone or put up posters and hold protests and things like that on campus. And they've explicitly banned kind of occupations and sit-ins. And then, um, you know, just yesterday, I think it was or the day before the university of Newcastle encampment was getting shut down by security. There's been an expulsion of an ANU student. Um, what are your kind of thoughts on this kind of overarch overall kind of intensified repression of activism, particularly of student activism? Yeah, well, it's quite shocking. I mean, when you when you boil it down, really, these protests and these, you know, methods are being used to try and enact policy change in universities. Like, ultimately, we want an ethical policy where we don't want our university to work with weapons companies. And, you know, we've we've tried every single, met, you know, we've emailed, we've called, we've met with the university, and the university has not responded to any of those. And that's what, you know, 
those sorts of engagements are what lead to protests and people feeling like they need to take further measures. So I guess I would put questions to universities, like if students, you know, are genuinely unhappy with a policy that a university have, and they have taken all of these measures to communicate this to the university and the university still ignores them, what do they expect students to do? And now they've put on, you know, there are repression, um, sort of there are laws to try and get students to have to ask for permission to do protests and things like that. What does that say about like freedom of expression, freedom of assembly and that sort of thing? So I guess the university, universities in general are creating absolutely no space for robust dialogue and conversation about these policies. Um, and we're seeing more and more that universities are sort of they're operating like corporations rather than universities and that's really concerning so we need to be able to have a voice to express why we're not happy with that um and what changes we want so it's it's quite shocking but at the end of the day these measures only make students want to fight harder and um you know achieve their goals even more with even more bigger so yeah mm, definitely um well just uh as you mentioned earlier there was a a protest last week in support of uh, you know, against this repression of students and in support of the 21 students who are being, who are having the disciplinary hearing. Um, and you mentioned it had a lot of community support and I saw some photos of, of that and it looked really great. Um, I was just wondering uh, if there's any more actions coming up or how else can people who, uh, can people show their support uh, or solidarity uh, with the campaign? Yeah, well, um, I guess at the moment, semester two starts next week. So we've all been sort of left hanging a little bit in limbo. We're not really sure, you know, we haven't received any outcomes. Um, I guess at the moment, we are asking people to, you know, email the university, email the vice chancellor. If you're an organisation or a company, put out a public statement of support. Um, you know, we're in a position where we can't really do much until we find out the outcomes. But yeah, I would say public expressions of support, contacting the university. If you're alum, if you're an alum alumni, um, you know, you've got a lot of weight in what you're saying to the university. Um, if you're a donor of the university as well. Um, so yeah, just to demand that the university drops these uh, misconduct allegations. Awesome. So yeah, anyone listening, make sure you support in any way that you can. And I guess as was semester two starts we'll look to you know how the all the campaigns at different campuses around the country kick off um i know obviously you've won disclosure at university of melbourne but we've got to keep going for full divestment and i know a lot of other campuses are, are kind of saying you know we're kicking back into gear as the semester starts up again so we'll be following that on here and on the green left website and everything so people can follow along there we'll definitely Love to have you back to chat uh, with any further developments that happen in the next few months. Oh, great, we'd love to. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much. We're joined now by Katrina Harley, who's a member of the Sutton Bar Club and Sussex Alliance. But, uh, we're going to talk to her a bit about uh, a recent action. Yeah, so Petrina, that was, you know, a pretty uh, awesome looking protest um, that you took part in, in the part over the past week against the Burrup Pub project. Um, but I guess before we get to that, could you give us a bit of a, uh, a background on what is this, uh, what is this Burrup Pub project and um, uh, Woodside, who's the company who are behind it, and why our campaign is opposing it? Um, you know, what's, what's so bad about uh, the Burrup Pub project? Yeah, sure. Um, so the Barrett Pub project is probably Australia's biggest uh, polluting fossil fuel project um, to date. It's a series of um, what they do is they break it down into kind of tiny little sections so it doesn't seem as bad. But ultimately, there is um, industrialized industrialized sorry industrialization of the hub going on, which involves so there's a, a fertiliser plant there already. Um, Perdamon are now building a second one. There's um, a Parapa gas plant. There's Scarpa gas plant. The Scarpa gas is now uh, expanding to twice its size. Um, there are two offshore platforms. So there's a massive, like down a massive gas seam off the coast. Um, so they've, they're building two gas platforms there. Um, and ultimately, 
we went up there. So this is actually the second time I've done a similar, very similar protest. First time I went up was when the um, investment for, for Sparber Gas had been agreed on and running it. Since then, it's been, what, three years. Um, now, Browse Basin is kind of like the last um, fourth piece of the puzzle, if you like, um, which hasn't got all its approvals yet, so there's still a chance we could stop that one. And this one's really important because basically this um, second platform will, will provide the extra gas needed to feed all the other kind of industrialisation going on. Um, and even worse, so the, the fracking companies now up north as far as Broome are talking about fracking there. And obviously, if they get all their approvals, then Scarborough Gas is, um, or the Barrett Pub project in that Browse Basin are going to be taking their gas as well. So we're looking at, um, you know, hundreds of kilometres of pipeline from Broome to Caratha, and then from Caratha offshore, like 400 kilometres, it's going through um, Scotts Reef, which is a migratory path for whales, endangered species of turtle, um, the total emissions, if all this goes ahead, we're looking at 6 billion tonnes of uh, toxic CO2 into the atmosphere over the next 50 years. They're asking the government to extend their licence for 50 years. Um, and, of course, we've also got ancient Murujuka rock art up there. We're talking 50,000 years of, of, you know, rock painting. And, um, yeah, heard them in already are basically just digging it up moving it, they say, safely, but of course, you know, breaking the song lines, um, culture, people, people are um, devastated. And, yeah, the whole thing is just horrific. It has to be stopped. Yeah, it uh, sounds pretty awful. And, you know, as you mentioned, it's not just the climate uh, crisis aspect that's contributing to, yeah, the destruction of, you know, some of the oldest art in the world that we've yeah. got. It's... Absolutely. When you think anywhere else in the world, right? I mean, this, this rock art, it's older than the pyramids. It's older than Stonehenge. Like any other country would be, you know, making it national heritage, sealing it off, protecting it. And yeah, Australia, there's gas to be had, let's dig it up. You know, I mean, the, the outrage that um, recently got poured out when some protesters, you know, kind of spread some corn cold, cold starch on Stonehenge. Yeah. <laughs> The comparison you're making comparison there between the actual legitimate destruction of of uh, like second art and you know what is just a, a washable yeah page. <laughs> absolutely well that was um DVH's first um first action if you like was when um someone went to the art gallery and spray painted the Woodside logo across an iconic um painting of course didn't damage the painting it was just the covered in glass and stuff. Trying to make that connection, but we get outraged about, you know, some painting that's 200 years old and it's completely protected and it hasn't been harmed with, yeah, this, this, this amazing, in, incredible rock art that's, yeah. Mm, yeah, 100%. And I, I guess, um, so for people who, who don't know, you uh, went up to the kind of the, the one road that goes into the Barrett Pub project and uh, locked on to, I think it was a, a truck or an SUV and uh blocked the road so could you tell us a little bit more about uh the action and i guess also what else has um disrupt Barrett pub been up to uh over the past few years yeah for sure so um disrupt Barrett pub has only been around uh not even two years yet um so this action what we did is we um took a boat a, a car and a boat so that we could get across both lanes um, we had a concrete barrel on the on the back of the unit of a car, and then I was in the boat with my arm and placing a concrete barrel that we actually we cut a hole through the um, boat so we could set the concrete barrel onto the road so they could just shoot the whole boat off the road. Um, and yeah, as they locked on there for twelve hours, I got to try to get through this this barrel. Shout out to the the builds the builders of this barrel it was uh yeah it was pretty satisfying lying there while they tried to get into it and I said it. <laughs> um as I said this is actually the, the second time we've done something last time we did it in a caravan um and um yeah so so the idea behind that is obviously to um we did it at kind of shift change to, to stop the workers from, from going in um 
the DBH is kind of, you know, two prongs, twofold. It's to break the social license of Woodside and those companies because especially in WA, you know, our state is completely captured by the fossil fuel industry. Um, Woodside kind of play like, you know, we're the nice guys, we provide all this money and jobs and economic growth and and so then they they sponsor, you know, all the arts and all the sports to make it look like, you know, they're, they're giving back to society. Um, so early actions in DBH were things like, um, well, that first action, like I said, that's to make the connection between the, the rock art that was, like, really clever. Um, then we've done things like, uh, so Dockers, the, you know, Creo um, football team are sponsored by Woodside. So one action um, member, you know, got onto the field with a big flag and got them down. Um, we've done things like, you know, sit-ins at, at ministers' offices, um, rallies at Woodside. Recently, um, Emma, who uh, she was the one locked on to the car, she and a couple of others um, got into the AGM meeting and, you know, made big busts. Um, so, yeah, it's all about changing that social licence, making people realise, you know, how much damage they are doing to the state and, and how much resources and stuff they are taking. Because that's what people don't realise as well, you know. It's the, the gas that they're, um, it's all for export. Mm. They pay hardly any tax on it. We subsidise it. Like, our dollars are subsidising this industry. I think it was to the tune of, like, $11 billion last year alone. Um, Meg O'Neill, <laughs> Uh, she earned something like her own personal annual salary of $12 million. For context, Megan Neal is the CEO of Woodside. Yeah, yeah. And last year, uh, Woodside's own offshore workers were striking, were having to strike for better wages. Um, there's been a load of cuts, like a load of um, sackings or redundancies or whatever. So, um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's trying to educate people as to not only the damage they're doing, obviously, um, but the fact that, yeah, they're not they're not the company they you know, portray themselves to be. They're not beneficial to Australians' economy. Um, mm. I mean, I always argue tourism brings in more jobs and dollars than the mining industry, and here's Woodside destroying these beautiful sites that, you know, tourists would come especially to see. Um, and... Yeah, so lots of actions in the beginning were to break that social licence and then actions like the one we just did is obviously try and um, disrupt business, you know, cost them a shitload of money, scare the investors, we want to stop people investing in them. Um, uh, yeah, that's basically it. Yeah, and it's like, it's, it's tricky because there was this story recently that a lot of the banks who are claiming that they don't invest in fossil fuels at all it's come out that they actually have been behind yeah. using kind of sneak they want to keep it secret right so yeah it's, you know it's not seen as a, as a good thing to be associated with yeah. companies anymore um yeah, and at the, at the agm even their own shareholders voted down their climate policy so it's you know it's it's, it's crap it's not it's mm. not good so the fact that yeah I mean, that's the way to get them. They don't, they don't care about the pollution. They don't care what they're doing. You know, they get what they want, get their profits, and they fuck off and leave all the, sorry, podcasts, <laughs> um, and just leave all the pollution. Uh, but they do care about the investors, obviously, and, and if people start seeing what they are um, and realise, you know, it's a, it's a dying industry anyway, which is why they're expanding as fast and hard as they can because they just want to get it while it's still there and do not care about it consequences um mm. so yeah it, it's trying to um make the investors and the shareholders uneasy and um stop people investing in them and to cost them money so it, it becomes difficult for them to maintain the business as usual yeah 100 percent. one one thing i just wanted to mention for people who are listening is like um the borough peninsula is not just like just outside of Perth or something. It's a long, it's a long way away, yeah. um, which does make it tricky. I, I, I imagine to uh, you know mobilize to get people up there or get uh, any kind of protests or things happening. Um, so, I guess yeah. Could you talk a little bit about that that kind of geographical challenge? But also, 
What's been the kind of uh, response from police and and uh, things like that to the to, pro- to the protest you've been part of? Um, this time round, I must admit it was it was very different. First time round, I really felt the weight of the state. Like the, I mean, it's a fossil fuel town, right? It's the ninety percent of the business is, is all around the, the bar. Um, so feeling that, yeah, the ire of the the workers, the police, the um, I mean, I went to court. Well, I was on trial for like over a year because I was pleading not guilty because he's only used that as well to push the emergency defence. Um, so, but both times I must admit, I feel like I've just been run out of town, like run out of dodge. Right? And it's been, um, yeah, really, really impressive. But here in Perth, it, it's just been so excessive. Like, um, we've still got about eight activists who are still facing court um, for, you know, stunts, if you like, harmless stunts that they, they pulled over a year ago. So um, one of them, for example, she let off a, a gas canister in the Woodside headquarters here in Perth, um, and they, evac- they had to evacuate for the whole day. So, again, interrupt the business. Um, and I thought it was a really, really another clever thing to do because the gas they used is actually the gas that mining companies will use if there's an emergency to clear everybody out. So it's completely harmless. You know? um, of course, they all came out, or they had, they were all executives as well. I think about four of them said they had to go to hospital and had breathing difficulties and all the rest. It was a complete lie. Um, but Chris is facing, uh, so Woodside wanted to privately sue her as well. Um, and she's facing like prison time for, you know, letting off a harmless gas canister. It wasn't even in the building, it was in the foyer. Um, we have another woman uh, who simply sprayed logos on Parliament House. Um, but what the police have been doing is um, is trying to get everyone on conspiracy charges. So they're trying to, you know, break DDH down so that we're all left in court or bankrupt. Or, um, and what they do is, you know, they've been seizing devices, seizing laptops, seizing phones, and, like, if there's one message between one person and another, someone, well, quite a few people have been, are now facing charges for actions that they weren't even at. Like, wow. Yeah. Um, so that whole, I don't know if you guys over there heard about the Four Corners program? Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah, where a couple of our activists, again, they went to the CEO's house, private residence, with a neck lock, they were literally going to um, lock themselves to her front gate and paint slogans on the door. Um, for that, they literally had the SWAT team, specialised police force, waiting overnight for them because they got wind of it. Because we allowed a Four Corners team to come in, they were all like, yeah, yeah, yeah we, we want to, you know, show, show the activist scene, show what's going on. And um, ultimately, they were forced to hand over footage to the police. Mm. Um, so, yeah, we're really dirty at the ABC because, yeah, they just basically betrayed their sources. And because of that, the footage that they were given, I think three people, three more people got arrested for that action. Um, and then, of course, it's all, you know, blown up in the press. This is someone's private residence. How dare they threaten her life? You know, Meg O'Neill came out. You know, I felt threatened and my children felt threatened. Now, her children are adults. <laughs> 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 um, these are the same... Children that um, Emma and, and Tom, those the young uh, 17-year-olds, called out in the AGM. And, again, it's all weaponising children and, you know, how dare you bring people's family into it. And, you know, our argument is all the activities you are doing are putting everyone's lives at risk and all our kids' futures at risk. And um, they even had the, that Four Corners program, so they had the police commission on there. Um, and they said, you know, how can you devote so many resources to peaceful act was literally what was, you know, four kids with a with a paint can um, and they get the ASIO SWAT team, whereas, you know, domestic violence is going through the roof and it, it's like, and the police commissioner was there like, oh, no, we, you know, anyone, if anyone was in that position, we would have, you know, responded accordingly in the same ways. 
you wouldn't. <laughs> no way you'd have the police protecting your millionaire seat. I mean, a you know, ordinary person, working class. If I find out the police is there, oh, my God, I think there's some kids that want to be feeding my fence, you know. <laughs> I'm going to get the police out. I'm going to get laughed at. Definitely not the squat team. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So we're, we're kind of being picked with the same laws they brought in to um, police, like biker gangs. We're seen as, you know, criminal terrorists mm. about to destroy everyone's like, way of life, whereas we're not, you know. The ordinary people that, you know, that just, just, just can't go ahead, can't happen. Mm. I, I remember seeing the headlines of the, of that uh about the all the children being used and threatened and you yeah. kind of assume oh they must be like you know 12 or something and then seeing yeah, that they're yeah, actually yeah. adults yeah yeah <laughs> they're well, older than the um yeah they're older than the kids that were yeah. at that agm well yeah. after the latest action so emma being 17 she's year 12 student and me being a teacher suddenly it's all like oh grooming i'm grooming this child into a life of crime it's like i haven't met emma until you know, the start of organising this action. She doesn't even live in Perth. She's down south. Um, she came up through the ranks of the student school strikers. So she's been active, you know, for a couple of years now. She mm. knows for sure why, she, why she's an actor. She doesn't need adults telling her, you know, you need to do this, this is what's going on. And they are fully aware. I mean, she, she's incredible. She was staunch. And, um, yeah, but they try and, yeah, they just try and discredit us and, all through the press, because of course, WA is just it, the state capture is in, insane. Like even mm. the you know those that own the paper have you know shares and ties with the fossil fuel industry, and it's all um yeah. It's a, yeah, I mean, uh, visiting uh, Perth for the Eco Socialism Conference a few weeks ago. Got it, I missed it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the massive shame. Um, <laughs> we had COVID, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I notice you, it's so uh, blatant that the, you know, pretty much every building is a, a mining company or, you know, and there's the signs and billboards everywhere for about yeah. one side. And Did you make it up to the Parliament House? Did you stand on the steps of Parliament yeah. House? Yeah. And yeah, all laid out in front of Parliament House, almost around. You've got you've got Woodside, you've got Rio Tinto, you've got you know all the banks. It's yeah, it's, yeah, it's pretty yeah. pretty blatant. Um, I guess uh, you know, I think the climate movement in Australia was probably at its peak in like 2019 when there was those massive school strikes and um, a lot of activity, and it was kind of uh, cut off a bit by the pandemic and lockdowns and that. Uh, killed a bit of the momentum and obviously yeah. trying to build back up to having a big climate movement um and obviously i mean the last uh, nine months has been so uh, heavy with the palestine uh activity so that's also taken up a lot of the space but uh i think you know what what do you kind of see as the role of like these these great kind of disruptive actions and direct actions that disrupt, uh, disrupt borough harbor taking and building kind of a, a bigger mass climate movement at the same time. What's the yeah, kind of relationship? Yeah, pretty much like our, our um, socialist ideals, it's, it's building that mass movement, that mass consciousness. And as you say, because of the distance, it is very, very difficult. But, um, you know, we would love to see, uh, there was a similar, so James Price Point is a place that's um, up near Broome as well. And they had a similar campaign, although they managed to have an encampment up there, like with rolling, you know, lock-ons daily. Uh, I think it went on for about six months. Uh, again, that was Woodside, and they won that campaign. So this this is our this is our aim is to get the numbers um, and the resources to allow people to yeah devote enough time that they can just we can just camp up there. You know, close up because, as you say, getting to and from and getting jobs and it's 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 really difficult. So we do, you know, these little actions here again to try and inspire and build build numbers. Um, we have like public meetings and NBDA training days and things like that. Um, and then actions like these obviously inspire a whole new new set of people. Um, but it's it's a big dilemma because because of security, because you have to um, be so secret about it. 
it's hard to to build. Like you, you know, you've been bringing new people, but you still you still end up with kind of a core group, core leadership group, if you like, that are, are making the decisions on what actions we do and the rest of it. Ideally, you know, we like to make a lot more democratic where we can, um, as a result of these public meetings, people themselves can come up with actions and ideas and, and build things like all over the place. So we've got, you know, multiple layers and, and multiple people. But it's, um, yeah, it's that's what's pretty difficult at the moment. It's, it's how do we keep things secret from the state <laughs> while bringing in, you know, all these new people. Hundred um, percent. I think that's all the kind of questions I had. I don't know if you have anything else, Riley. But yeah, thanks so much for joining us, Petrina. It's been really, you know, inspiring and good to hear about the, you know, what's going on out west for me. Uh, and also, just you know, uh, we'll definitely be following the whatever other activities that uh, you and Disrupt Barrett Pub get up to over the next uh, little while. So you're welcome back on the podcast anytime to talk about that. Thank mm-hmm. you. Um, <laughs> I'll just point people as well if they're interested in this kind of uh, discussion. Uh, we've got uh, one of the sessions at Eco Socialism uh, featured uh, Raylene Cooper, who is from the Save Our founder of Save Our Songlines, and talked uh, a lot about this um, campaign from a kind of First Nations perspective as well. Um, so definitely check that out on the podcast feed or on YouTube as well. Um, but yeah, uh, thanks so much, Petrina. Can I also give DBH a plug? Say so people um, go to our website, just disrupt our pub, and there are ways you can join and get involved. And it doesn't necessarily involve having to get arrested. The luggage yeah. park is up 16 hours in order, <laughs> towing yeah. a one ton barrel on the back of a boat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we'll, yeah. We'll, put a link to, yeah, we'll put a link to the website in the description as well so people can click through on there. So that, that'll be good. Yeah. And that's about all we've got time for for this episode of the Green Left News Podcast. Uh, Before we go, we've just got a few events uh, coming up that we'd like to plug. If you're in New South Wales, there's a protest outside the New South Wales uh, Labour Conference, which is on the 27th of July at Sydney Town Hall. Um, So it'll be attended by both Anthony Albanese and the New South Wales Premier Chris Minns. Um, And, you know, it's an important chance to send a direct message to... Labour Party that we don't stand for their that we don't support their um, support for Israel and what they're doing in Gaza. Um, so there's a protest at 12 p.m. Um, around uh, you know Labour's support for the genocide. But there's also other protests throughout the day around housing, um, uh, climate, and a few other issues. So uh, check out the Green Left calendar for that. And uh, here in Bully Perth, uh, we've got the upcoming Indian Ocean Defence and Security conference, which is a major getting together of all the uh, peddlers of weapons and death in uh, across the country, uh, builders where AUKUS meets the quad. So there will be a, um opening rally at the convention centre outside protesting that uh, starting at 7.30am quite early um, on Wednesday the 24th of July and there will also be plenty of um, the, the protests throughout the, the three-day conference. And obviously make sure you get to your weekend Palestine rallies, whether they're happening weekly or fortnightly or monthly or whatever uh, in your city um, and all the other actions that are happening. You can go to the Green Left calendar, greenleft.org.au slash events to find stuff happening near you. Um, just a, a big thanks to Sean Valenzuela or at Little Archer Beats for the music uh, you've heard on this podcast. Um, if you'd like to support the work that we do, um, you can become a Green Left supporter at greenleft.org.au slash support. Um, uh, we're, you know, 100% people powered. We don't take any corporate advertising or sponsorship. So we rely on uh, uh, the generous supporters to, to, um, to keep, uh, keep the lights on and keep this project going. Um, so we really appreciate any support you can give. Uh, alternatively, we've also got a Patreon uh, page. So if you prefer to support on Patreon, you can uh, look up Green Left on there. Um, but yes, thanks for listening to this episode of the Green Left Podcast, and we'll see you next week. Bye.